I invite your attention now to our scripture reading for today, which comes from Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 through 13. In the New International Translation of the Bible, it is paraphrased, Hagar and Ishmael sent away. Hear ye the word of God. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because the boy and because of your, by your slave woman, whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing and adhering to his holy word. Let us pray. God, as we gather here on this summer's morning, we are grateful for so many, so many people, so many things. But most of all, God, we are grateful for your grace that continues to connect us and bind us. We are grateful this morning, God, for your love that is the mortar that connects us on this day. And God, whether we are present in this sanctuary, whether we are present at home or perhaps even in our car listening to this broadcast, God, we, we know that you are present and that you cover us. And so now, God, we ask that you would bless your word on today, that it would go forth with power, power to transform, power to do that which only you can do power to change our circumstance, our conditions. Even God, we give you permission to change our attitudes. We ask this God under the anointing of your Holy Spirit and in that name which is above every other name, Jesus the Christ and the people of God assembled here and at home and beyond, say amen and amen. I must admit that sharing this sermon, this title, Good Times, has been very much a challenge for me in the midst of COVID-19. I've had to look far and wide and deep to find where are the good times. Nonetheless, we can always find good times, a good word, and good news in the word of God. So let us get into what I call the way back machine as we travel back to 1970, which we find the beginning and the genesis of this situation comedy, some people call it a sitcom, uh, called Good Times. This situation comedy or sitcom that chronicles the life of the, M of the Evans family. You all know the Evans family. There was James the Patriarch who struggled to find work and provide for the family. See, Mike James was always looking for a job. Florida, the matriarch, who cared and nurtured for her family and worked as a domestic and as a maid. Now, now we wouldn't complete the family if we didn't remember JJ, so named because he's James Jr., but he's JJ, also known as Kid Dynamite. JJ, who's the oldest son, the quick-witted JJ, the comic relief JJ, the JJ who has a real gift and the ability to express himself on paper, on canvas, with pencil and color, who has a real gift from God, who's an aspiring artist. 
Now we can't forget Thelma, who's affectionately known as her daddy by the term baby girl, who, on, who only in later episodes, it, rather it is only in later episodes that her character is fully developed as a caring, nurturing older sister, and we find her even becoming a kind of surrogate mother to others that come along. Well, completing the Evans family was the youngest son, Michael. The family intellect, the brain of the family who had hopes for college and medical school. Good Times is filled with the hopes of the Evans family. Now, you all know I, I, I couldn't do this well if I did not complete the cast, the original cast, and round it out with that sassy sister by the name of, you all know, Walona. Walona had something to say about everything at all times to anybody. She never bit her tongue. She was stylish, and she could have said black girls rock before the t-shirt came out. Walona was the upstairs neighbor who was not afraid to speak her mind on any subject to anybody. Any, anybody here remember Walona? Yes. Now, now, during the sixth season run of Good Times, the delight of family and the despair of living in poverty often took center stage in Good Times. There was family fun, but what I remember the most was the family feuds that fueled the comedic engine of the sitcom's writers. They had plenty of ongoing family feuds. Of course, there was the ongoing feud between the outspoken Walona versus James. They would always get into it. You see, James was the strong black, I'm the head of this house man. And James would always meet Walona with a quip or with some kind of reaction to anything she would say. There was also the feud, the ongoing feud between uh, JJ and everybody. Seemed like JJ kept some stuff going all the time, no matter who. I'll come back to that. JJ versus Michael. JJ versus his mama, Florida. JJ versus Walona. J.J. versus his dad. J.J. was in trouble with everybody most of the time. But the best ongoing feud on good times that I remember and liked the most was the feud between J.J. and his sister Thelma. Well, you say, well, why did they get it on like this? You see, Thelma, as, Thelma, as I mentioned before, often played the role of surrogate mother when Florida was working hard, when she was cleaning floors and doing other folks' laundry, often it was relegated to Thelma to prepare the meals and to clean the house and make everything stay in order when, when, when Florida was not present. But her lack of cooking skills were often the brunt of JJ's jokes. I, I, I often remember JJ saying things like, uh, who's cooking tonight? And he would find out that Thelma was cooking. He would say, he would say something along the lines, good, I, I'm glad I took the antidote before we eat. Because he was inferring that her food was like poison. But Thelma continued to go on and continued to be that surrogate mother. Her lack of cooking skills were always the brunt of JJ's comedic criticism. It's easy to see how living in poverty, keeping your head above water, scratching and surviving, and eating easy credit ripoffs. Ain't we lucky we got them good times? There were plenty of feuds. I think we can get one or two witnesses, whether here or online, that could testify that they could experience perhaps some feuds as a result of being sheltering in place as a result of being with one another, the person who you thought they were aren't really who they are. Or either you just get tired of that person. So I would imagine that good times, in the midst of good times, the feud still may ensue in, even in your home if it's anything like my home. However, while there were feuds in conflict, at the end of most good times episode, the viewing audience could anticipate being given the last laugh. They would always leave us with some humorous anecdote or something positive to go forward with. 
You see, when the Evans family had nothing else to hold on to, they were able to hold on to hope. Hope in their dreams and hope in their aspirations in spite of difficult circumstances. Ultimately, through the faith of Florida, they held on to hope in God through their God-fearing mama. I believe they could still laugh because they had hope. Today, I would submit to you that hope in God allows you and I and all of us to rise above the limitations of our current circumstances and to look beyond to a hoped for future. A close reading of Genesis reveals that laughter, laughter nuances the entire story or narrative of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar and Ishmael. You can't mention Sarah and Abraham and Isaac without mentioning Abraham, Ishmael, and Hagar. Their stories are interwoven, and there's a wonderful interplay that takes place between their lives. In Genesis 17, 17, we begin to get a sense of the laughter that fills this narrative. In Genesis 17, 17, God, Abraham laughs in disbelief when God informs him at the age of 90, he will have a son. That may be laughable to some that are here today. Not only that, but in Genesis 18, 12, we hear the cynical laughter of Sarah when she is told by the angel of God that she's going to have a child. You all know the scripture. It says, and God told her she was going to have a child. And she says, and Sarah laughed to herself. You all know that laugh. That's the laugh that says, mm-hmm, really? Yeah, but it's a cynical laugh. Going further into Genesis, into the 21st chapter, we hear the joyous laughter of Sarah now after having given birth to, uh, to Isaac. Not only her joyous laughter, but we hear the joyous laughter of community at the birth of Isaac. But the laughter does not stop there. The story would be incomplete. Genesis 21.9 goes forward and it informs us in this manner. It says, but Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Abraham, and her Egyptian servant, Hagar, making fun of her son. They were laughing. They were making fun of her son, Isaac. So she turned to Abraham and demanded, check this out, get rid of that slave woman and her son. He's not going to share the inheritance with my son, Isaac. She goes further to say, I won't have it. Now anybody who understands a little, little bit about the biblical history understands that the inheritance would fall to the firstborn. So Isaac, Ishmael rather, was entitled to the inheritance. But Sarah said, mm-mm, we're not having any of that. Not my son, we're not gonna share the promise of Abraham with anybody else belongs to us. So now you might be sitting back there at home, even perhaps in these pews where I see just dozens of people in my mind's eye. You might be saying to yourself, you might be saying, self, what happened? Why does this child's play induce the ire of Sarah. You might be asking yourself, why isn't, why everyone isn't laughing when these children are at play? What happened to life's laugh track when Isaac began to poke a little fun, rather Ishmael began to poke a little fun at Isaac? Well, let me tell you with a quickness that first of all, real life is not a sitcom. Real life is filled with ups, and real life is filled with downs. Real life is filled with difficult circumstances and joys as well as concerns. You see, what are good times for some? You need to understand that what are good times for some are trying times for others. Good is a relative term. 
what's good for you may not be good for me. I prefer, in fact, to use the term equitability. I'd rather be treated with equitability than to be treated in, in necessary a relativistic term like good, because good is different for everyone. You see, especially good times are different for each person, especially when one's person's good times comes at the expense of another person's life. If my good time means meaning you have to have a bad time, or you, I have to exploit someone in order to have a good time, then is that really a good time? I don't have, to I don't have time to share with you how until recent history, the commodification and monetization of the black juvenile imagination has meant good times for some and meager gains for others. What you're saying, preacher? What I'm saying is that vis-a-vis -vis the rap game, hip-hop music, we find that there are many music producers that have made big bank on young black minds and young black imaginations until the advent of music moguls like Jay-Z and the like, most of us have been relegated to meager gains. And so therefore, our very imagination, our very creativity has been confiscated and commodified so that somebody else could have a better time than our good time. Y'all don't hear me today. This story ought to remind us that good is relative. Here we find the Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and her son, whose father is Abraham. From the beginning of this, this story, Hagar has been manipulated by her masters. She is useful to them because she can produce. And in this sense, she can produce a child. Oh, when I begin to think about the way in which our economic system operates, that we only find value as long as you can produce, as long as you're useful to continue to grease the wheels of commerce, then you have usefulness. Oh, I wish there were one or two witnesses in the house today that could testify to understanding that the people that have the most education and are the least paid oftentimes are educators, but they have the most important job in crafting and molding young minds. Here we find Hagar being manipulated by her masters. She's useful to them because she can produce a child. She can produce an heir. She can make sure that the line is continued. When she and her child are no longer of value to Abraham and Sarah, when there is a threat that the father's inheritance, that the father's promise may be shared or worse, fall into the hands of Hagar and her son, they are banished to the wilderness. We got no more use for you. Oh, I can hear the cries of black and brown bodies from the prison industrial complex. We got no use for you. We got no place for you. So we're going to make money on you the only way we can by housing you and making money on you. I wish I could get one witness today. In what I would argue, but, but, but I, let me just back up just for a minute. You see, this threat to the inheritance of the promise of Abraham is what really threatens uh, 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 Sarah and her son and allows them to be banished. But God has given Abraham God has given us more than one promise. Both Ishmael and Isaac are promised children. Both of them are children of God. And what I would argue is a highly redacted text. God lets Abraham off the hook by becoming complicit and co-signing this plan to send the child and their mother into the wilderness. God tells him that there's a plan for Ishmael and God will make Ishmael a great nation. So go ahead and send him into the wilderness. As we continue to read Genesis 21, we find Ishmael, Hagar and Ishmael wandering aimlessly in the wilderness, in the desert, if you will. You see, all the food is gone. All the water is gone. All that they have been given from 
Abraham and from his household is gone. In fact, I would dare say that all hope is gone. In fact, near death, she places Ishmael, who is near death, under a bush to die. She can't bear to see her child die, her future die. She can't bear to see her promise die. So filled with grief and weeping, she moves far away not to see him die. But hold on, Hagar. God hears Ishmael's cries. Oh, that ought to make somebody get a little bit excited. God hears Ishmael's cry because God always hears God's promise. God always hears what God has promised and God always fulfills God's promise. God hears Ishmael's cry. Hagar cries out, the mama cries out, but God hears the child. Can't you see God with his ear cup toward Chicago, Illinois, toward the United States of America, hearing the cries of our children saying, Black Lives Matter, saying that I matter, I am God's promise. You had your turn, but now my promised time is come. God hears and filled with grief and weeping, she moves away, but we got to hold on, you see. I find it fascinating that even though both Hagar and Ishmael is cry are crying, the Bible makes it clear that God hears the boy's cry. God hears the child's cry. You see, both Isaac and Ishmael, to make it plain, are God's promise. The children are the promise. Both are meant to share in God's inheritance. You see, church, you see those out there who are watching today, until we begin to have equitability and understand that God's grace is abundant, that there is more than enough, and we begin to share the inheritance, the blessings of God in an equitable kind of fashion, God's children are going to continue to cry out. We must understand that both God's children, Isaac and Ishmael, share in the inheritance, have a right to the inheritance. Both are the fulfillment of God's word. God said, I'm going to give you a child, and both are the fulfillment of God's promise and God's word. Both are God's promises personified, Both, and God always keeps God's promise. God always hears God's promise. Somebody needs to understand is that in a promise, we can find hope. In promise, we can find good times. I need to let you know what the word hope means and what it signifies. Hope means that hold on, pain ends. Hold on to hope because hope reminds us that pain will end. That trouble don't last all way. COVID-19 is going to end. This crisis we live in is going to end. Why? Because I have hope. You have hope. We each can rest in the arms of God's hope. The songwriter said, Brother Johnson, he said what? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and what? Righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only holy lean on Jesus' name. In Christ, the solid rock I stand. Somebody ought to get excited about that. I'm going to tell you why. Because I can have faith in myself, but I need hope in something else. I need hope in something bigger than me. Something better than me. Something inspiring me. Hope, faith is built on past performance, but a hope is built on future performance. We can have hope because we have a promise. And as long as you can remember God's promise, you can have hope. Well, I know some of you are saying, well, what's God's promise? Isaiah 26, 3 said it like this. I will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Psalm 27 said it like this, yet another promise. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? Nehemiah 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 10 said, 
the joy of the Lord is my strength. Well, I'm going to close it down now. And as I conclude, I want you to know that hope changes everything. You see, life is filled with full-fledged problems, but God gives us fulfilled promises. You see, hope changes everything. Hope determines effort. Hope is a verb as well as a noun. We can be hopeful because God has more than one promise. Hope implies several things. Number one is that hope implies that you engage your imagination in becoming a co-creator with God of a preferred destiny and future. It implies that you encounter the provided pathways to hope. It also implies that you exercise your agency. So don't become exhausted. Do not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap a harvest. In this story, Sarah, not even Isaac has the last laugh. God has the last laugh because God fulfills God's promises and God's promises never fail. Amen.